Good morning and welcome back uh, to the lecture series on partition of India in print media and cinema. So, today we are going to talk about refugee desh and nation a new module. Uh, so, before we start uh, discussing on this new topic, we need to understand the definition of refugee. So, uh, there are many critics, uh, many scholars on partition that have uh, uh, worked on the refugees and that define the refugee. So, uh, Uditi Shen uh, refers to the figure of the displaced minority uh, during the partition of India. Uh, as migrants, refugees, uh, displaced persons, mohajirs and uh, as evacuees. So, these are the common uh, terms or expressions that are used for people that were displaced from uh, one part of the subcontinent to the other, uh, which went on to become a new post-colonial nation state. And so, uh, Uditi Shen says that the centrality of displaced persons in histories of partition is not merely born of the scale and complexity of the refugee crisis unleashed by the hurried division of British India. It is also indicative of a peculiar feature of partition refugees. The refugees who sought shelter in India and Pakistan in the aftermath of partition claimed to be both refugees and citizens of their putative homelands. This allowed partition refugees to occupy a visible and central place in the post partition polities of South Asia. So, uh, when we talk of refugee, we need to understand that uh, it is a very uh, complex uh, position, subject position um, in a new nation state. Uh, and it uh, entails a number of uh, reactions by the uh, social group itself and uh, by the non-refugees. Uh, so, uh, it is a paradoxical position where the refugee has a lingering past, uh, a kind of uh, background, a kind of history that uh, bears its weight on his or her identity and yet uh, the process of bargaining with the nation state is co it is constant uh, and that is uh, something which defines the journey from uh, being a refugee to becoming a citizen. So, uh, the refugeeness is expressed through one's um, nostalgia for the desh that one left behind where one could never uh, go back. So, a journey uh, to a point of no return is uh, something uh, that uh, essentially defines the refugee experience and uh, also a journey to uh, a new land, a new uh, the host uh, nation state and land. And so, um, like I said, if there is a paradoxical uh, uh, situation or a paradoxical uh, position of the displaced person who uh, does not want to cut off uh, the umbilical cord that attaches that that uh, you know connects one with uh, the desh, the homeland where uh, one belongs uh, in terms of lineage, in terms of ancestral property. Uh, and yet, one wants to uh, establish oneself in the new host land where one has been, where one has relocated as a result of the partition. So, uh, when we talk of the refugee worldwide, there are certain uh, popular imaginations and pictures that come to our mind that uh, of the helpless and the homeless uh, who is in need of rehabilitation. So, photos and descriptions of uh, famished people uh, actually inform uh, the, the notion of refugee. People in crowds, in, in groups, in large groups, uh, in railway stations, in camps um, enhance the image 
of uh, the popular uh, image and imaginary of the refugee. So, uh, the very ordinary and mundane acts such as cooking, sleeping, uh, sitting with the family in groups and waiting in the queue for doles, uh, where uh, after the partition these, uh, these mundane acts such as cooking, sleeping, uh, sitting with the family, uh, waiting in queue uh, went on to become uh, special refugee activities. In other words, whatever the uh, refugees would do, ordinary human acts would be, uh, would become the defining characteristic of the refugee. Uh, the mundane activities were being read through the prism of the refugee. So, once uh, what I am trying to get at is that once a person uh, became a part of this social category refugee, uh, they could hardly uh, be anything else although they were uh, as humans as uh, and uh, as uh, you know their needs the basic needs were as ordinary as any other person the entire activities would be uh, understood, would be grasped through the prism of uh, refugee and refugeeness. So, Ravinda Kaur in her uh, research notes that all previous identities and social distinctions were collapsed, they were uh, in a way uh, conflated, uh, made to disappear and uh, this process actually constituted the uh, formation of refugee. So, refugee was an archetype of dislocated people in need of uh, resettlement, relocation within the post-colonial citizenry. From refugees, the process of uh, journeying, the process of the journey from refugee to citizenship. Uh, was also seen as a process of healing of one's body and spirit. So, one realizes that refugee as a term does not uh, harbinger positive uh, meanings so or positive import. Uh, it is a, a situation from which one needs to uh, come out at the earliest. From uh, so, so uh, not being a refugee anymore is also uh, connoted uh, as a process of having healed, having recuperated, having rebounded, bounced back into uh, normalcy, normal uh, way of life. So, Kaur uh, states that the refugee body, the refugee body for the purposes of policy making is a dispirited male body that can be repaired successfully while the female bodies remain mostly absent, appearing only to signify the atrocities of sexual violence and abduction by the enemy. So, here we have to understand that implicit uh, in the term in the social marker refugee uh, is a specific gender, uh, a specific age and uh, as we will learn subsequently also a specific class who speaks about the refugee, who gets to speak about the uh, refugee conditions, about the refugee way of existence. It is typically the standard uh, image of refugee is fulfilled by a young uh, male displaced person uh, who is uh, uh, in his prime not too young to be a juvenile, not too old uh, to be uh, someone that cannot participate in the nation building process. So, uh, it is referring to uh, refugee refers to typically speaking it is a young male uh, from a privileged class and caste that gets to speak about the entire refugee experience and this is something that the critics actually problematize and revisit because refugee experience is not uh, <coughs> homogeneous and uh, one, but it is 
varied, uh, multi-layered with diverse meanings, diverse uh, existences, diverse uh, experiences. So, Hannah Arendt uh, in her study of totalitarianism in Europe establishes the link between state formation and the flow of refugee. So, how is a nation basically formed? There is certainly a, a connection between how nation uh, is built through an ex, uh, through, through uh, a grammar of exclusion, through uh, an act of exclusion. So, nation state lends legitimacy to some at the expense of getting rid of the other. So, uh, one's membership in a nation also means that one is not a member in another nation. One cannot simultaneously belong to different nations. It is a question of allegiance, it is a question of loyalty of uh, and, and in the process of nation state actually goes on to shape an individual citizen's identity. So, uh, nation state is uh, it facilitates uh, identity formation through uh, you know categorizing individuals as self and other people that are part of the nation the denizens versus the ones that are outsiders. And so, the refugee is someone that was an outsider that carries the history, the, the baggage of being an outsider, once being an outsider that uh, came as a result of political social upheaval, as a result of historical decisions that came and started uh, dwelling in, uh, in, the, in the host land uh, at a given time period. So, Sajal Nag notes how uh, the divide and rule politics by the colonial state uh, by the British Raj uh, followed by decades of communal mobilization uh, actually uh, logically led to uh, the partition of British India. So, uh, when we talk of the refugee question, we look at the discussions within the constituent assembly uh, which rapidly led to a broad based consensus that uh, the Hindu and Sikh uh, minorities that fled from Pakistan belonged to and belonged in India. So, uh, in 1950 the refugees right to belong to India was enshrined in the constitution. Article 5 allowed citizenship uh, through registration to all such uh, individuals that had migrated to India from Pakistan provided that they had arrived in India before the uh, commencement of the constitution. Yet we see that the influx of the refugees continued well beyond 1950 and informed subsequent discussions on citizenship. So, uh, this is also something that critics have time and again questioned how we can uh, um, uh, define the abducted person or the refugee, uh, who is a refugee, who is not, who is uh, a legitimate uh, uh, you know who, who, is a, uh, who is a real claimant, who is a justified claimant to the government's uh, welfare uh, policies. Uh, or, or government doles who is not and how such definitions of uh, the abducted person and then the refugee can be tied to and bracketed within certain dates. So, people before and after this date uh, do not uh, subscribe to the uh, criteria of being an abducted person or a refugee although they have experienced uh, the same situation they uh, although they migrated under uh, similar conditions if not the same. So, uh, tying the definition to specific dates uh, is uh, something that has been problematized uh, by scholars. Uh, 
The question of refugee belonging uh, re-emerged as a dominant concern in 1955, uh, which molded the texture of the debate around the citizenship bill further. Representatives from West Bengal such as B. K. Das uh, criticize uh, the citizenship bill for demanding a bureaucratic process of registration uh, uh, from the poorer refugees and uh, more so as uh, th this is actually questionable because the, the destitute refugees uh, in most cases would not possess the necessary papers expected of them. So, uh, instead of in lieu of uh, registration, B. K. Das wanted the bill to provide a definition for displaced persons that would declare all such persons as citizens of India. Now, uh, Pandit Pant of the United Provinces had a different take. He insisted that registration was indeed necessary in order to avoid confusion and yet he clarified that the citizenship bill did not propose to endow partition refugees with a new right or uh, was not meant to monitor their eligibility for citizenship. So, India's citizenship bill formally acknowledges the contradictory category of the citizen refugee. So, uh, refugees uh, as a category remain an oxymoron where uh, they uh, and this is something we are going to talk about more in our subsequent lectures where uh, the memory from a homeland left behind shape greatly shape their culture, their psyche uh, and yet uh, there is constantly uh, a struggle to establish themselves in the present, in the current uh, situation, in the in the current uh, you know geopolitical uh, space. So, uh, there is a dealing with a temporal spatial reality left behind uh, and a temporal spatial reality that uh, they inhabit in the present. So, there is a kind of interesting uh, interaction between the two which uh, churns out the identity of the refugee. Uh, we will also see, we will also note uh, how the refugee experience like I said is uh, heterogeneous, uh, diverse and there is a class caste uh, connection. The class and caste of the, the of a given refugee uh, determines how much uh, they can lay claim on and how much they can celebrate uh, their culture from the land that they left behind. So, uh, it has been uh, researched and argued that uh, refugees from the upper echelons, rather immigrants uh, uh, could celebrate uh, and uh, maintain, celebrate, preserve the cultures that they had inherited uh, from their homeland from their desh. We see this in both sides of the border. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, re-establishing their family business in the host land and through the name of the shop, uh, one commemorates the land that one belongs to, that the land that one comes from. So, uh, in, in Calcutta, for example, there are uh, so many uh, business uh, enterprises, establishments, uh, commercial uh, you know uh, enterprises that are named after Dhaka. So, the elite uh, immigrants are capable of celebrating, commemorating uh, the past that they celebrate and commemorate uh, their roots. We see similar say, uh, you know commemoration uh, on the western side. Uh, in, in Punjab, where people uh, name their shops, their enterprises uh, after Lahore, after Rawalpindi, uh, so places uh, that their ancestors actually came from. So, uh, and yet uh, on the other hand, the Dalit refugees cannot really afford to do that. They, uh, so, so, celebration of one's uh, ethnicity, of one's culture, of one's uh, 
uh, specific uh, you know linguistic ethnic uh, belonging uh, is uh, greatly boosted by uh, economic uh, e economic uh, surplus e economic uh, uh, you know uh, economically advantaged position not everyone can do that the dalit refugees tend to merge with in a way camouflage with the uh, host uh, lands culture they are not uh, in in commonly speaking they are not very assertive about their uh, culture their dish that they left behind their language they try to merge and and unlearn in a way unlearn uh, about their uh, dish we see that refugee is not a homogeneous identity but respond in different ways to the macro schema uh, the ongoings in the nation and the micro factors affect the refugees decision in uh, settlement and uh, so so the larger factors affect the refugees decision in settlement and in constructing the experiences and identities of the refugees so these factors include policies and measures taken by the government the geographical conditions of migration then the caste and class affiliation all of which combine uh, to to uh, form the refugee experience so uh, holborn uh, gives us the definition of uh, refugee according to holborn the refugee is an in involuntary migrant a victim of politics war or natural catastrophe so every refugee is naturally a migrant but not every migrant is a refugee difference between the two uh, is based on whether someone's movement is voluntary so uh, for refugees the push factor uh, becomes uh, important uh, or becomes dominant it determines their displacement push factor meaning something that has uh, an unpleasant event a, a political uh, happening that uh, propelled them to uh, uh, shift to move their base from one uh, nation state to another so uh, that's a push that's a push factor versus uh, there are uh, alleged pull factors uh, where a person moves to another land uh, in search for greener pastures so for uh, socio economic uh, uh, you know uh, upward mobility one uh, chooses uh, to become citizen in another nation that's the pull factor uh, so uh, in the case of india uh, uh, you know in the case of the partition of india the push factor largely determined the uh, uh, displacement of uh, popul uh, uh, you know displacement of uh, a large population from you know belonging to different communities so pablo bos notes that the notion of two unified uh, homogeneous monolithic communities uh, uh hindu and um, the hindus and the muslims and uh, their uh, relationship as uh, co-religionists is uh, profoundly inaccurate and uh, it uh, such imagination actually invisibilizes so many other people that are also coexisting uh, in the subcontinent so uh, it uh, does a great disservice to the cultural Uh, linguistic ethnic and religious differences and uh, thereby the complex uh, multi layered uh, texture that uh, that that uh, defines uh, india or that defines south asia so uh, for example when we talk only about these two communities and uh, even the decision of partition that gave undue importance that uh, in a way amplified the the presence of these two communities uh, uh, such uh, treatment such undue uh, you know uh, visibility being rendered to only to the hindus and the muslims uh, happen uh, at the at the expense of failing to recognize that other communities also exist people such as the jains the sikhs and uh, so many other a uh, tribal uh, so many other tribal groups so so the process of the construction of a self uh, 
based on assumption of homogeneity uh, had actually led to the formation of Pakistan and yet one realized that um, the Muslims which I keep repeating in so many I have already uh, stated this in my earlier lectures the Muslims in South Asia are not a monolithic group a homogeneous group uh, and um, this is something realized through further tearing away of Bangladesh from Pakistan on the grounds of uh, a separate ethnicity, separate culture and separate language. So, besides redrawing the geophysical structure of a state, partition uh, permanently damaged the psychological and cultural matrix of the people. The, for example, the, the uh, partition engendered a permanent uh, uh, refugee crisis in South Asia, a permanent refugee crisis uh, that remained uh, open ended and uh, uh, unresolved to a great extent. So, uh, some, uh, some of the popular colloquial terms that we one uses for the refugee in South Asia such as Udbastu, Sharanarthi, Bastuhara. Uh, and then there are terms uh, such as for the Bengalis, uh, there is a term called Bangal, for uh, uh, the, the Punjabis there is the term called Mohajir and then Bohiragato, Bideshi, uh, for the Hindus the Muslims use uh, a term which could be uh, read as a slang, it is Malaun. All these terms became part of daily vocabulary in the refugee absorbent states. It, it uh, uh, brings, I mean, it it uh, it uh, tells us about the gaze of the natives and also the counter gaze. It leads to the question of uh, the gaze by the native uh, populace on the refugees and the counter gaze. And there is a point where these terms are uh, being owned. It, it uh, echoes the black movement or the feminist movement, the radical feminist movement where uh, uh, the abusive terms are owned and become a point of strength for a given social group. So, people say yes I am a black, I am a, a whore or, or a slut. So, so it is a response to slut shaming in the same way. Uh, People would say in Bengal, for example, there, there was a, a very powerful slogan uh, formed by the refugees, Amrakara Bastuhara, who are we? We are refugees, we are uh, the ones that have lost uh, our lands, our homelands. So, so the refugees soon discovered um, the issue of identity as being something very, very complex and multiple. And so, in the process of transformation, the concept of self would often shift uh, from religious to linguistic to cultural and economic such that the political space and identity of the refugee became uh, really uh, complicated and nuanced. It was never, uh, I mean it is very difficult in a South Asian, in the South Asian context it is very difficult to put the case and the uh, question of the refugee in a straight jacket. So, onus of a successful transition from refugeeness to citizenship lay in one's resourcefulness uh, depending on how much of uh, social, uh, economic, cultural capital one brought with oneself, one would be successfully uh, rehabilitated, res resettled in the new land. So, the core principle of official res resettlement uh, policy was uh, self rehabilitation and the populace, the section of immigrants that could self rehabilitate themselves, self rehabilitate themselves were seen as the assets of the uh, host land, assets in the host land they did not, they were not seen as economic or social abusers. Otherwise, uh, they were uh, pejorative uh, you know expressions or, or pejorative ideas uh, associated with uh, refugees, there were some in the common parlance refugees would be um, uh, uh, you know you would be described as people that did not uh, constructively uh, 
contribute to the making of the uh, post colonial society. So, a study of Bengal shows how an authentic refugee uh, type within the state discourse was fashioned uh, after the Punjab experience and yet this was a fiasco since uh, the frame, the frame of uh, uh, Punjab, the, the process of uh, partition in Punjab and the process of more, more so the process of rehabilitation, the process of rehabilitation and resettlement in Punjab hardly uh, you know uh, informed and hardly fitted uh, the, the reality of Bengal. In Bengal, uh, the, the notions of refugeeness, the, the understanding of refugeeness lay outside the strict meanings uh, or the strict definitions uh, that were uh, etched at that time. So, uh, in Bengal, when we look at the case of Bengal, we realize that there ought to be, it, uh, the, the case of Bengal entails uh, dissolution and, and redefinition of the term uh, refugee because of the a very different process of uh, displacement, a very different process of immigration, the, the, pro, the, the reality where one sees that Bengali refugees keep uh, trickling uh, uh, across a porous border, uh, a border that was never sealed because of the Nehru Liaquat uh, Pact. And uh, so, uh, the definition uh, falls short, the, de the strict uh, you know meanings of refugeeness fall short to contain the case of Bengal. We will talk more about this and I will meet you again with uh, another topic and another lecture. Thank you.